It gives me very great pleasure to introduce Catherine O'Toole, that's Catherine O'Donoghue, excuse me, who has just been appointed as the new chair of the National Disability Authority. So we thought we'd really throw her in the deep end at our, uh, our um, major event uh, of the year. Um, but she has served on the authority for the last four years, so she is very familiar with our work. And she brings 30 years of leadership experience in the business sector as well, having held senior positions in companies including Google, General Electric and Ernst & Young. And she also brings the lived experience of being a family member and a supporter of her brother John, who was somebody with an intellectual disability. So welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Aideen. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for that very, uh, very flattering introduction. Um, I am truly delighted and honoured to have been appointed the chair of the NDA, and I would like to take this moment to sincerely thank Helen Guinan, our previous chair, for her, her incredible work over the last eight years. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to all of you attending both here in the room and online. And I would like to especially give a warm welcome to our speakers today, and in particular, Minister Anne Rabbit, who is the Minister of State with Responsibility for Disabilities. The UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has, for many years, informed the NDA's work as a statutory, independent research and advisory body to government, and it will continue to do so. The NDA remains committed to bringing evidence-informed advice and learning from the expertise and experiences of persons with disabilities themselves to guide the policies, programmes and strategies development, developed by government. Many of you are aware of our work and that the NDA provides independent analysis and assessments of progress of existing disability strategies and policies. We are currently working with the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth to support the development of a UN CRPD implementation strategy. This conference is the third in a series where the NDA has examined an article of the UN CRPD. The conference in 2020 looked at Article 13, Access to Justice. And in 2021, it was on Article 12, equal recognition before the law. Examining Article 9, accessibility, is the purpose of today's event. Article 9 of the UNCRPD states that state parties shall take appropriate measures to ensure to persons with disabilities access on an equal basis with others to the physical environment, to transportation, to information and communications including information and communications technologies and systems, and to other facilities and services open to or provided to the public, both in urban and rural areas, to enable persons with disabilities to live independently and participate fully in all aspects of life. The Convention places duties on states with regard to promoting universal design. Ireland is unique in having a statutory centre for excellence in universal design, which is part of the NDA. The centre promotes the universal design of the built environment, products, services, and information and communications technology. The adoption of universal design means that all things would be easy to access, to understand, and to use by everyone, regardless of age, size, ability, or disability. Later this year, we will publish our annual report, which will highlight our work in 2021. And many of these relate to accessibility and universal design. Last December, we published Ireland's first monitoring report under the EU Web Accessibility Directive. And this report was submitted by Minister Ryan in the Department of Environment, Climate and Communications to the European Union. This monitoring continues, and we continue to work with the public sector to build its capacity to ensure improved compliance with the directive. Earlier this year, the 2020 report on monitoring of part five of the Disability Act was published and found that the percentage of disabled people working in the public sector was 3.1%, the same percentage as in 2019. The NDA has undertaken a review of the operation of part five of the Disability Act 
and implementation of the recommendations of this review will ensure that Part 5 monitoring is enhanced and that the Part 5 process becomes a driver of equality, diversity and inclusion agendas in the public sector. We ensure that in our numerous submissions to various government consultations that we reference accessibility and universal design, particularly in terms of statutory obligations of public bodies to providing accessible services and communications. We've made several submissions in relation to transport, including Bus Connects, focusing on taking a universal design approach to those consultations. A submission on the Electoral Reform Bill focused on accessible voting, and our submissions to Housing for All and the National Housing Strategy for Disabled People focused on universal designed housing. In early 2021, the National Transport Authority published a new universal design walkability audit tool for roads and streets in Ireland. This audit tool can be used to capture the existing conditions of a specified walking route in relation to its walkability. The Centre for Excellence in Universal Design provided advice on the development of the audit tool, along with Age Friendly Ireland and Green Schools. This included engagement with people with a range of accessibility requirements, including old, older people, parents with buggies, people with physical disabilities and people with visual impairments, as well as a pilot of the draft version of the tool in Kilrush, County Clare. And we have heard from the stakeholders involved how using the tool and sharing the findings were very powerful in guiding local authorities to make funding decisions to improve accessibility. We're also pleased to be involved in supporting SOLAS in their development of inclusive learning environments using a universal design for learning framework and their subsequent guidelines on universal design for learning for further education and training. We are currently engaged with supporting the Higher Education Authority to roll out their programme for access to higher education, which this year is funding inclusive, universally designed higher education environments for all. This conference is an opportunity to take a holistic approach to examining the barriers facing disabled people who, despite many improvements in recent years, are still frequently presented with an inaccessible built environment, inaccessible public services and transport, inaccessible information and communication, as well as negative attitudes and assumptions. The sessions today will focus not only on good practice in the public and private sectors, but will also examine solutions to existing barriers and explore ways of incentivizing accessibility and universal design. We will hear from practitioners in the, both the private and public sectors, and which will allow lessons, innovations and successes to be shared. And with that, let me reiterate once again how welcome you all are to the NDA Annual Conference 2022. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you find it informative and thought-provoking. I'll just hand back to Aidan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. And now it gives me very great pleasure to welcome Minister Anne Rabbit to formally open the NDA Conference 2022. We're very grateful for her, to her for taking time out of her busy schedule to do this today. Minister. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us here this morning and for all of the people that are online. And for anybody who is visually impaired, I'm standing here on a podium this morning. I have my glasses on my head and I have a sleeveless jacket and my blouse is gold and black. So, and I'm wearing jeans. So just so as everybody gets a sense of how I look and, and where I'm standing in the room. And I'm facing a, a group of in excess of a hundred people um, looking up at me in a beautiful room, which is sensory adapted with, with, with a plum coloured lighting to meet the needs. And it's a very inclusive space here in Crow Park. Uh, and I have to compliment at the very start, India on the choice of such a location. So it's my pleasure to be here today um, in order to open this conference as Minister with Responsibility for Disability. This is my third NDA conference, but my first one in person. And I want to thank Aideen and the team um, for having me again. 
I'm very pleased to recently appoint a Catherine to the position of chairperson of the NDA, and I know that she will bring great energy and commitment to that role. Her familiarity with the NDA, having spent the last four years and as an authority member, means she can hit the ground running and bring continuity. And I wish her all the best in the role. And I think it's awful important to have continuity in whatever we do and that familiarisation so is that there is no gaps missed, that the conversation continues going. And whether it's on this board or any board, it's so important that we ensure, particularly where we're talking about disability, that inclusive conversation, because at all times we struggle to keep the momentum, to keep us going in the one direction. And that's why I think really we're in a very positive momentum when it comes to, to disability at this moment in time. There's a real positive direction and focus on it. Uh, and I have to compliment um, the NDA in, in providing government with such support uh, and such guidance over the last number of years. When I started as Minister, I didn't have a detailed understanding of universal design. However, through engagement with the NDA, the Centre of Excellence in Universal Design and many other stakeholders, I am now a convert and understand the many barriers faced by disabled people can be addressed by good design. Universal design is good design. It benefits everyone, regardless of their age, size or disability. If a universal design approach is followed, it will help to create more integrated and inclusive services, products, built environment and information communication and assistive technologies. I am delighted that this year's conference is focusing on Article 9 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. In my view, article, in my view the article accessibility is one of the fundamental and foundational articles in the con Convention. And like, if we all put ourselves in that position, like, if we haven't got proper access, whether it's to employment, whether it's to housing, whether it's to the built environment, we can't engage, we can't have an inclusive, equal society to participate in. So that is why we need to ensure we have a complete understanding of Article 9. And it's no good just us here in the room understanding Article 9, or the viewers looking in understanding Article 9. We need all government bodies to understand Article 9. We need all our local authorities to understand Article 9. And we need everybody who shapes our environment to understand Article 9. Legislation and regulation is one of the ways of ensuring accessibility. We already have the EU Web Accessibility Directive that requires public bodies to have accessible websites and mobile applications. And you will hear more later about how the NDA are monitoring compliance with that directive. We also have a code of practice on accessibility of public services and information provided by public bodies under part three of the Disability Act, which is also monitored by the NDA. Minister O'Gorman last year requested the NDA to develop a code of practice on accessible public buildings, and this is under development. One, once developed, this, along with the Code of Practice on Heritage Sites, will lead to improved accessibility and facilitate better monitoring of accessibility of public buildings. And I always think about where I come from myself in, in Portumna and County Galway and the beautiful castle that we have and the three steps up to us. Um, the three steps up to us that uh, only able-bodied people could access. And I always remember asking the OPW, can we just have a little ramp that you could take up and take down? And no, that would interfere with the heritage. But I'm delighted to say that conversation has moved on. The ramp now sits under the three steps and anybody on a chair or, is, or has a difficulty on accessing steps can now get in and out of the, the, the castle. That's a small piece, but it's a big step to think for many years we didn't have that access. We also have the Irish Sign Language Act 2017, which puts obligations of public bodies to provide Irish Sign Language when requested to access services. The Assisted Decision Making Capacity Amendment Bill is due to be enacted this year, and that will increase the percentage of public sector employees who are disabled, as legislated for in Part 5 of the Disability Act 2005, from a minimum target of 3% to 6% by 2025. 
This increased target is important and should spur departments and public bodies to create more accessible, inclusive and diverse working environments. I note that the 2020 NDA monitoring report on part five, 28% of the public bodies reported that over 6% of their employees had a disability. So we have a long way to go to achieve that all of the public bodies. However, I am reliably informed that, that this has increased to over one third of the public bodies for 2021, and that report will be published early next year. Finally, in terms of legislation, work is underway by my officials to transport the European Accessibility Act. This is an important act as unlike the other legislative instruments I mentioned that only apply to the public sector, this applies to both public and private sectors. It will ensure the accessibility of a number of services and products within member states and will lead to a more accessible products um, and services in the market and to more affordable prices. I recognise that departments and public bodies have many compliance requirements and it is important therefore that we have clear information, advice and guidance on how to comply with their obligations. And I think that has been a huge barrier down through the years. Um, people were really, really trying their best, departments were trying their best, public bodies were trying their best. But without a clear defined pathway, it is really difficult um, for everybody to go in the one direction at the one pace. And that in itself has been a huge barrier because what might be going on in one place wouldn't be happening in another. Much of this, improve, much of this is provided by the NDA and the Centre of Excellence in Universal Design. I would also urge departments and public bodies to go beyond the bare minimum. Indeed, I believe that departments and public bodies should be striving to create a better service and a better environment than that what exists today. In addition to legislation to drive accessibility, learning about the lived experience of disabled people and sharing best practice are also important to advance the accessibility and the universal design agendas. And I think I think I talk about local authority and planning and design when I talk about that. Uh, and I also talk about understanding UDA and plus and plus plus, as I can see. And I look down here at, at, at Dr. Jer, who explained it so well to me. And if I am not an engineer and I am not a designer, but I understand the basic concept and I expect all local authorities and all planning officials to understand the same basic concept. User participation is a key element for deliver of de universal design. And we know that good participatory, participatory process lead to increased transparency in the development of legislation and policy, which in turn improves trust and builds relationships that last beyond the timeline of the process. I am also happy today to launch the Centre of Excellence of Universal Design, new e-learning module of universal design in the built environment called Buildings for Everyone, Central Bank of Ireland. The module is based on a case study of the Central Bank of Ireland, which won the Royal Institute of Architects in Ireland Universal Design Award 2017. And it is aimed at professionals involved in the design and the procurement of buildings and illustrates how universal design was embedded from the very start of the design process for the Central Bank of Ireland building. I understand that we will hear from Tony Murray this afternoon about this design of the central bank and watch a video from part of the e-learning module. The online module is now available to access from the CEUD website, universaldesign.ie. And I would encourage all of you to take a look at well done and all involved in this creation. This module is part of an important direction in which we need to move from universal design being a niche consideration to a key part of all design and processes, fostering a virtuous circle of good design, innovation, practice and in in innovation. In our diverse society, ensuring that a universal design approach is taken as a matter of standard practice makes certain that integrated and inclusive services are available to everyone. I want to assure everyone in attendance and online 
and in person that the implementation of the UNCRPD very much remains the responsibility of all government departments. We have started the process to develop a UNCRPD implementation strategy to replace the National Disability Inclusion Strategy when it reaches the end of its lifetime this year. And I anticipate that accessibility and universal design will be a key pillar of that strategy. I would like to finish by thanking you all for your attention and I hope you enjoy and learn from the conference. And while I will apologize now, I have to leave later on. It's a busy, dull schedule. But um, my colleagues in the department, Colin, Tara and Niall, will be here to take on board everything that is said. So thank you so much for having me this morning. I will go over by two minutes. Thank you very much, Minister Rabbit. And I think you've really highlighted the obligations on all of us in the public sector to not just meet minimum requirements, but really strive to exceed them. So now I'm going to hand over to Marion Wilkinson, who's Senior Policy Advisor in the National Disability Authority, who will introduce the next session. Thank you, Aideen. Thank you, Minister. And thank you, Catherine, our new chairperson. I'm absolutely delighted this morning to introduce to you um, a businesswoman, an activist, uh, Caroline Casey. Caroline, as you know, has been responsible for the Value 500 um, uh, uh, initiative. This is the world's largest collective of CEOs. And we're going to do something a little bit different this morning. I'm going to have an interview. Uh, with Caroline about her experience and about what uh, sh talents and skills she's brought to this uh, theme and initiative. Thank you. So, that's to make sure that you're in conversation. I don't talk too much. I think that's probably right. Um, can I just begin, uh, Marion, for anybody else um, who has their video off or visually impaired like me, I'm also going to describe myself. Thank you, Minister Rabbit, for doing that. Um, I'm a white woman with very white blonde hair, white skin. I'm wearing a ludicrously pink shirt, it's quite raspberry, a pair of black jeans as well, and very thick black rimmed glasses. So that's what I look like today. Thank you for that, Caroline. And when we were uh, arranging this, um, some questions came in from uh, colleagues and people, uh, and, and we've compiled these for, for the interview. And it's we, we've heard you speak, Caroline, about your experience in, in your childhood and your youth, and where you've said that the world wasn't designed for you or didn't have you in mind. And we were look, considering how that experience has brought you to where you are now. If you could tell us a little bit about um, what how that shaped you and what you do. Thank you. Well, first of all, it's my 51st birthday today. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and can I just say it's great being 50 or over 50. You don't give so much of a shit what people think uh, and makes you an even better activist. But I was born in 1971 um, and six months after I was born, I was diagnosed with a rare condition called ocular albinism. Um, and that means um, after one foot, my vision is very blurry. Um, but as the taxi man said to me this morning, you don't look blind. <laughs> I never know what that actually means, um, but I don't. And I have a very unusual story because my parents um, decided to bring me up as a sighted child, not disclosing my vision impairment because I had what they believed was usable vision. And so um, the reason they chose that is because the world wasn't designed for people who are different. And we look at our children now, and for those of us who, are niece, who have nieces and nephews, sons, daughters, grandchildren, what we want to say to them is, you're perfect the way you are. And that's a sentiment that we love, but the world is not designed for that sentiment, and it certainly wasn't back then. So that's why my parents brought me up, knowing that the world wasn't designed for people with disabilities, both physically, accessibly, but most importantly, in our mindset. And they didn't want me to have a label that was going to minimize what it was that I could do. So on my 17th birthday in 1989, my father got me a driving lesson, random. Um, and that's when I discovered that I had this condition. And then I went into the closet, the disability closet for 11 years, 
because I knew the business world certainly wasn't designed for people with disabilities. And that's where I stayed. And I came out of that closet um, 21 years ago, and I have been a disability troublemaker activist um, ever since. Caroline, thank you for that. Um, God, and my voice is shaking. Yeah. <laughs> it feels like I've come full circle. I just want to acknowledge everything in the NDA. You know, I've been working in this space a really long time. And when I first started the work for the Ability Awards, I just want to acknowledge the NDA were one of our partners. And it's extraordinary to see the work that you're doing. And, and Jer Craddock out there, oh my gosh, uh, a global leader on the stage for universal design and accessibility. And I just want to acknowledge the role that Ireland has in the world never underestimate what our small country is doing. And the Valuable 500 w began, the principles of the Valuable 500, which is the world's second biggest coalition of business and CEOs after UN Global Compact began in this country with partnership like organizations like the NDA and all the businesses that we have. So I love, and I'm very proud to be Irish. It feels like I've come first circuit today. Sincerely grateful that you are here today and to uh, share your story and your experience. And that in particular, how you established the Valuable 500, could you share with us some lessons that you've learned about how a disability is being addressed in so I'm going to give Marion's because she's been speaking without the mic. <laughs> um, I think the question is why we established the Valuable 500 and how disability is seen in business. Look, I could go on a million years why we established the Valuable 500, but I'm going to give you the heart reason. Number one, my father died very unexpectedly in October 2016. And when you see somebody pass that you love unexpectedly, you do reconsider your life. And I had been an activist for so long, but I had not seen the accelerated change around disability that I really wanted to see. And he whispered in my ear a few days before he died. He said, look, you're not finished yet. Go and get out there and raise the tone. And I think that's the real reason why, but it also explains that disability has remained on the sidelines of society. It really has, but more importantly, it has remained on the sidelines of business. We cannot end the disability exclusion crisis that exists for just under 20% of our global population without the most powerful force on the planet taking its place, and that is business. Business touches every single aspect of our lives, like it or not. Business controls the power with its money. And you know what? Despite the fact that every single human being on this planet is going to be touched by disability, Despite the fact when we put a mother and a father beside the 1.5 billion people who have a disability, we talk about 54% of our global economy. Disability is sort of like the poor cousin at the end, at the edge. Now, as far as I'm concerned, inclusive business will create inclusive society, completely backing the work that's being done in the not-for-profit sector and governments. We can't leave it just to not-for-profit and governments because it's too big a crisis. So we need business realistically. And I don't want your charity. We don't need your pity because we are valuable. And the only way that we could change that is to break the CEO silence. We need to break CEO silence because leaders make choices and those choices create culture. And if we have CEOs who are not willing to speak about disability, where's the money going to happen? Where's the permission? Where's the excitement about bringing it through our businesses? And that's what the Valuable 500 was created to do end the CEO silence and great accountability at the top of the organizations. Don't delegate it down to somebody who's over, overburdened already. And the second thing to do is stop the hierarchy of exclusion. Stop the silos. You know, one year we focus on gender and the next year we focus on LGBTQI, A. So which part of me business do you want? My gender or my blindness? I mean, really? You can't have a la carte inclusion. Inclusion is either all for everyone or not at all. So that was the intention behind the Valuable 500, but not to shame, but to show that there is an absolutely valuable market space that is sitting here. 1.3 billion people, with a mum and dad, I said 54% of our global economy, 13 trillion in, in disposable income. But forget that for a second, because we're here to talk about accessible employment. How do you think that you are going to serve that market if you do not have the talent in your business? And do you know that disability is a foundation, a foundation for insight and differentiation for companies? 
We forget, I know I say it all the time, forgive me, but the remote control was designed for blind people watching TV. Bit of an oxymoron, I get it. But still, SMS texting for deaf people, and yet we use it all. These are the most simple examples of what universal design is. And that is what business wants. And that is what we created the Valuable 500 for. Ending the leadership silence, getting them to be accountable, making sure disability is integrated right across our supply chains, and setting standards of excellence and accountability that support our governments, that support our not-for-profit sectors, and end this, this epidemic of exclusion that has sat in our society for so long. So, yeah, that's, that's the reason. I'm Car ranting. You can see yeah. it. No, Caroline, that's fantastic. Um, when you talk about uh, ending CEO silence, could you give us some practical guidance on how that has happened in the Valuable 500? What, what you have been able to generate in that space? Thank you. Well, first of all, the Valuable 500, um, <clears throat> I remember when I set up the Ability Awards and we insisted the CEO signed to become part of the program. And we had the Ability Awards Summit every year. And I got phone calls from some of the biggest brands in the world and saying, well, we're going to send our HR person. And I'm like, no, I don't want your HR person. I want your CEO. And like, do you know who we are? I said, I do, but I want your CEO. No CEO in this position of privilege has the right to delegate inclusion to somebody else. Yes, they can support and yes, they can give the budgets. But to become part of the Valuable 500, the CEO of the biggest brands in the world, and go onto our website and you can see it, there was a lot of hustling, had to give their signature to a board level commitment around leadership and disability. So whether a company was beginning the journey or scaling or leading, I, the CEO, will commit to making sure it stays at the top of our business. And then they had to communicate it to their employees and then we could communicate it to the rest of the world. I'm going to give you a stat. 7% of our current CEOs have a disability. Four out of five of them are hiding it. Like I hid mine 22 years ago. In the FTSE 100, there is no person with a disability in a senior leadership level or above. So therefore, let's bring this back to accessibility. In our FTSE 100 companies, a third of their websites are inaccessible. If you do not have leadership at the top of the business, that continues. And so there is the personal connection to disability that everybody has. And without a leader saying it or being responsible for it or being excited about it. So what we've seen in the Valuable 500, and this is so powerful, you see leaders coming out of their own closets, on stages, online. And what that does is to the people in the organization, they're going, that's me. I see me. Then they start talking about it. The ERG groups, the em employee resource groups, have now got executive sponsorship and budgets to ensure that disability intelligence is in the business. The most important thing you can do as a leader is to tell your story. And it's, we have seen it time and time and time again. When we don't speak, when we don't speak about things, they become a problem. And so what we're doing is giving the permission and safety and numbers for our leaders to speak. And so when you think about the Valuable 500 has done now, it, it's made history. Yeah, that's great. And I could have gone off to the Bahamas and kind of probably wish I should have. But what we could do now is what could we do, Marion, if we could get our 500 companies and tw those 22 million employees and that 23 market cap and those, you know, 41 countries and 64 sectors to go in one direction to remove the greatest barriers that exist to making disability in business a normal, aspect of business and reality. So our job now is to get those CEOs all going in one direction. That's fantastic, uh, Carolyn. Very tiring and, too. <laughs> yeah, but the energy um, to achieve that and do that. I just wanted to open this uh, to the floor now, if there were any questions or any questions coming in um, from online uh, for Caroline. If you could put up your hand and uh, wait till the mic comes and then just say what organization, your name and what organization you're from. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, just some comments that 
have come in through Zoom, and I suppose start off with the compliments about how Caroline's passion is really invigorating and energizing, and a sense of is Fader Lynn coming through very strongly. So um, another question was about the future direction. So looking looking ahead, uh, and I suppose trying to think about moving disability from the sidelines. Uh, have you any suggestions or thoughts about how uh, disabled people can be supported and encouraged at work? So I hid my disability for so long. By not owning my own, I became part of the problem. Everybody has a story and everybody has the right to belong as they are. The most important thing we need to do in our companies, we talk about accessibility, you know, like the built environment. For me, accessibility is the six inches between our ears, if our head is that small or big. It's about allowing and creating places where we encourage people to live their life and live their story. What's for me the greatest hope we might have right now is the younger generation, the Gen Zs, right? These are the ones that the CEOs want to employ and to get to be their customers. Those Gen Zs with social media in their hands are talking about disability pride, that disability is proud part of our identity. And I can say that now. I am proud. I am proud. This is part of my identity. Um, and I think that we need to move away from that because a very upsetting article I read this morning in the New York Times makes us believe that we have to hear your voices, use your voices. Is the New York Times just released an article to say that under anonymous circumstances that doctors would choose not to have disabled patients? An article yesterday is that Jeff Bezos um, is releasing 150 million, okay? He's one of the richest men in the world to help marginalized groups. Who do you think is missing off that? Disability. At the end of November, the UN is talking about human rights and business. Who do you think is missing off that? Disability. So I'll tell you how. Tell your story. Use your voice. And if that feels frightening, go to somebody else who's done it. The most important thing that we can do is own our story with pride and energy. Because the thing is, there are so many of us out there who are connected to disability. And when we raise that voice and we know that it's, it's with our own story in mind and we don't, if we, if we own our story, we don't take away from somebody else's. And I think that's what we're happening. There's a point of where we are really trying to own who we are. So my greatest, I guess, is hope for all of us is that we use our voice and our authority to be ourselves and therefore we make space for others. Um. And is there any questions from the audience here? Thank you. Hello, Caroline. My name is Paula Sorhin and I work for Independent Living Movement Ireland. I'm just wondering if you would have an idea of how many disabled people work in the companies that are uh, focused on the valuable, valuable uh, 500. Thank you very much for speaking today. It was very powerful. Thank you. Um, one thing I um, want to just acknowledge, uh, just thinking about the stories I've just said there, and I'm going to come back into what you've said, Paula, is um, on our advisory board, we want to represent, just so we're very clear, when we talk about disabilities, we could talk about the UN Convention and the representation. And I wanted to make sure that we had learning disability and intellectual disabilities represented on our board. Yes. And somebody suggested that I got a parent of somebody with intellectual disability. And I'm like, no, I want the human lived experience on the board. Mm -hmm. um, and not to say that that's always to be the case, and I don't want to be critical, but we need to see and hear those voices. And I'm incredibly proud to have that on our board, to have that lived experience. I'm going to give you a stat that is quite terrifying as well, because this is the truth. And we've done the research and some of our biggest companies like the Microsoft and the Channel 4s and everything else, we're starting to see this percolating. It is estimated that anything between 12 to 15 percent of the employees in our companies have lived experience of disability, but they are not disclosing. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And the reason they're not disclosing is this fear that I was speaking about. Will they have the same chance to be promoted, to have the career they want? Well, how would they feel that they're safe if their CEOs aren't going to do it, right? So one of the big pieces around the Valuable 500 as we work towards the next three years where I want to have a global reckoning on disability is are we looking at reporting of our people with disabilities in the business? Are we creating cultures where they feel safe? Because legislation, obviously disability is a protected characteristic. And so business are using that as an excuse. No, 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 no. We can do this. We can do this. You can still disclose of having a disability if it's anonymous, but if the word disability is included into your employee surveys. But right back to what we do know, Paula, 50% of the companies in the OECD countries who have targets, because there are lots of company countries who have targets, mm. they would rather pay a, pay a fine than actually make their cultures and their companies accessible and yeah. inclusive. Now, there you go, there's the problem. So most likely when we're looking at it, we're looking at a dismal level of anything between one to 3%. Okay, thank really? you, Really? <laughs> so we have to be there and help find that solution to create those cultures, to help our companies create those cultures, to hear the voice. Because if we were to, this is my big thing, what if we were to get our valuable 500 companies to disclose the truth, to uncover the truth, what, were, what would it be if we found out, out of our 22 million employees, 12% of them had a lived experience of disability? Well, then that proves this whole conversation is irrelevant. You already employ us. Stop making excuses not to. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Caroline. And there's a question. Um, who has the microphone? Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Colm O'Connell. I'm recently arrived at the Disability Division in the Department uh, of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth. Um, just want to start by saying, paying, paying tribute to um, Caroline, to your, um, your evident passion and energy. Um, it, it sounds like it must be tiring, frankly, that you'd mentioned it, uh, but also your clarity of thought and the clarity of vision uh, and the firmness uh, uh, of vision, and I'm sure your uh, indefatigability, um, if I've if I've pronounced that correctly. I've a question from government side: What does government, what what things should government be doing, or main things? I, I detect a smile here. Um, what what should we, what should government be doing in terms of supporting accessible employment, not just in the public sector, but in the private sector? Well, you know, it's like Thanks. you just did a beautiful setup there. Um, Dr. Kim, will you stand up, Dr. Kim? Dr. Kim Hoke will be speaking uh, later on the day, and I'm going to give that to you because he's the expert on this. And I really do urge um, the Irish government to follow the model. Could I not have you owe me one, Dr. Kim? Um, but uh, no, honestly, I mean that. But the the most important thing that what does the government need to do? Well, the government needs to lead. It is a it's not a business as such, but it needs to be leading in best practice. It needs to do it. Um, but the one part that we're seeing with our businesses, okay, we need to look like the life cycle of a human being, okay? So we look at business and say, you need to be employing more people with disabilities. Do we have an inclusive education system? Do we have an inclusive transportation system? So this isn't one thing that we need to understand about disability. It is not one piece on its own. It should be integrated into every aspect of our society. You need to go, the government, to go to your people within your department's government and find out that intelligence in the same way that we ask our businesses to do. But we have to understand that it's, it's a whole load of dots that lead up to employment. So what is the system along the way? And what I would say is you cannot expect people to get into employment if they couldn't get into education. You cannot expect people to get into work if we're not remotely working anymore, um, if we can't get into the transportation system. And I do think that one of the things that's the great, I want to end on a hopeful note, because I am hopeful and I'm very positive that we can make the change happen, because it's all about will and intention. I was so proud when the pandemic came. We were one of the very few countries in the world. There was our Taoiseach with an interpreter. Bloody great. Because do you know how many people didn't have that? So who are we speaking to? Who are our members of society? And this pandemic has given us an extraordinary ounce of hope 
from the business system. Businesses said it was too complicated, too hard, accommodations were too expensive. The business system changed in 17 days and they were able to recognise that every single one of their employees needed accommodation. And therefore, don't tell me we can't give accommodation for people with disabilities. And the best companies before the pandemic were those who had seen remote working as an opportunity, who had virtual accessibility. They were the companies that thrived. So this is no longer the business case for disability inclusion for our countries or for our companies. This is about future proofing the absolute energy of our country and our companies. This is about risk. The days of making the case for disability inclusion are over. Who ever said we had to make the case for people in our society or our business? It's about risk, it's about opportunity, and it's about future proofing the world for all of us. Caroline, thank you. Look, we have some time for um, maybe two more questions, uh, three at a push. Thank you. Hello, uh, Caroline, it's Siobhan Long from Enable Ireland. Um, I'm really enjoying your interview. Thanks very much. Um, and I'm really glad that you've touched on the pandemic because the innovation that we have seen societally, globally, and happily in the disability sector as well, um, as a response to COVID has been amazing. The use of technology, uh, the changing and the evolution of new models of service, enabling people to work from home and to, to do all of the things as you've mentioned um, has been fantastic. There's a real risk though, that we're going to lose some of those benefits because there's a, again, this ridiculous push back into the workplace, uh, which is so inequitable. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, we're, we're working really hard in Ireland on trying to develop an assistive technology ecosystem which would build on the IT infrastructure that's out there. I mean, the biggest contributions to accessibility uh, technologically have come from the big players in the IT sector, not from the, the you know, specialists in AT. But we still have so far to go in Ireland. We do not have a functioning AT ecosystem for people to get the technology that they may need. They're lucky in some respects if they're in the private sector because there is a grant available for them. If they're in the public sector, there isn't. Um, but even apart from that, as you rightly say, if you can't get inclusive and accessible education, you're not going to be in the workplace anyway. So I'm just wondering from your experience internationally, if there are any particular insights that you can share with us to help us press the fast forward button on really integrating and making available um, assistive and accessible technologies in more meaningful ways. Okay, well, I guess I have a very short amount of time and you can see I really do over talk, so I apologize. Um, I'm going to give an example for a second and like you're going to have Jared Craddock speaking so like seriously we've got one of the best leaders sitting in our room today just want to say that uh, around universal design and inclusive everything. Apple let's talk about Apple for a very quick second. Um, Apple was the first company in the world to trigger one trillion. That means successful right? So Steve Jobs difficult enough as he was but he was a visionary. We will have beautiful products for all. So when you have that, like I'm not saying Apple products are absolutely perfect, right? But what they are is more accessible than most products were. So it was the, the concept of universal design. So how do we really make sure that it's not just an Apple? The only way that we can ensure inclusive digital online experiences is that we have people with disabilities at the beginning of the design process. Sitting at the table, in the rooms, speaking about their experience. And then we're here about accessible employment. The only way that these companies are going to be able to reach the inclusion targets or the accessibility targets is having the brains and the intelligence and the lived experience in the room. And that is it. It is that simple. Look at this metaverse. I don't know about you guys, I'm scared I'm so scared of this metaverse. I don't want to live through ocular lenses and shit like that, right? But the point is, we get a chance right now as we're designing this, where are people with disabilities in the design process? So what we're seeing in our companies now is that they are 
appointing chief accessibility officers that run right across the functions of the business. There must be somebody in your business, in your department, government, who is responsible for accessibility with the support of the leadership and a budget. And they are allowed to reach out and get the talent and the skills and the experience into the design process that is required. And the most important thing that we can do is keep sharing, 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 sharing the successes and failures that we have. But it's sharing it because we will get there quicker, better, faster. And what we call the Valuable 500, it is 499 shortcuts to success for every one company. Because how do we share? And every single one of our companies will say, the difference is when we look to the talent, the disabled talent, when we're building in from the beginning, it makes sense. That's great. Thank you, Caroline. But there's one more hand up down there. Yeah, hi, Caroline. Tony from Irish Wheelchair Association. Um, you, you've cut me off at the past, really, with, with the answer there. I was, I was looking at the angle. What would you say to designers, to policymakers, to accountants in terms of the actual engagement of the people with the lived experience um, at the call front. You know, you, you speak about um, people coming out of the closet, owning their story, using their voice, um, and that, that's way behind as far as I can see. But from, I suppose that's the call out to people with a disability. Whereas when you're talking to, in the Irish context, government, um, you know, we're running campaigns. Our own vision as an organisation is that Ireland would be you know, a worldwide leader, an example of inclusivity, of accessibility and all of that. But yet there seems to be a huge lack of actual meaningful engagement. Oh, we have the experience. We have people with lots of experience in that area, but yet we're designing policies of exclusion. Um, we're building regulations that are excluding people and they're not there. So I suppose you've answered it in one way, but have you any sense of comparison internationally in terms of the actual engagement um, from an Irish perspective? I mean, Tony, can I just say, why don't we, we have people from the government here. Hello, again. Um, if we want to be the most inclusive and welcoming country in the world, let's just look for a second at our visitors coming into our country. Remember I talked about 13 trillion disposable income of the disability market. Well, if you add that to age, we are talking about something that is mind blowing. Is our tourism sector, we'll just talk about tourism for a second, is that really ready to welcome in tourists who have lived experience of disability? So, Tony, if I was queen of the day, <laughs> well, it's my birthday, um, I would say, wouldn't it be incredible if we got our government to set up a group, not of just doers and writing white papers, but a really strong group of people like you and organisations that are here, how do we create Ireland to be the most inclusive and welcoming country in the world? Because that means we have to look at our transportation system. That means we have to look at where money comes, our tourism. Why don't we start with that? Why don't we do it differently? Because if then we want to be the most inclusive country in the world, we need to educate our young people to do that, right? So the people with disabilities need to be in the education system so that they actually can serve it too. So for me, it's could we not, or would we be brave enough if we want to be the most welcoming country in the world? And don't we say we are the Ireland of a thousand trillion welcomes or whatever, but are we? Do we really welcome all? Do we even welcome our own people? Can our own people share in our society? I would love us to reframe it and reframe it in an energized way, in a way that actually is compelling to every single one of us. So if I was queen of the day, that's what I would do. And because I really believe the intelligence in this country, and I think with some, we have some brilliant activists in this country, we have some brilliant entrepreneurs with disability coming from this country, we have just some brilliant entrepreneurs. So could we reset it? Could we do something? But not just a talking shop, a doing shop. So I, I agree with you, Tony, it's, we could always do better, but we need to have your voices being the voices to show the way and doing it better. Thank you so much, Caroline, for that. And um, we are going to end this session. I want to have say a sincere thank you to Caroline for taking time out today and uh, an old bull in a bus for her birthday, please. Thank you. <laughs> so much i'm going to get you to
Um, we're going to move on to the next session now, and uh, I'm also delighted to uh, introduce Dr. Jer Caddick, who Caroline mentioned um, uh, in her uh, comments. And Jer is the Chief uh, Executive Officer for the Centre for Excellence in Universal Design uh, in the National Disability Authority. He has a uh, wide-ranging experience in um, in all things uh, universal design and accessible and uh, delighted that he is going to be joined by some of his colleagues as well in the centre. Uh, thank you, Chair. Great. Thanks very much, Marion, and thank you, Caroline, again for uh, an emotional uh, and a conference we ran in Dublin in 2018 was all about an emotional response. We were looking for people. so. Uh, delighted that you are here with us today. So, uh, I'm a mature white male uh, with a growing forward line and uh, uh, a sophisticated uh, goatee. And uh, I, I decided I'd wear a business suit today just to uh, kind of complicate things. So, um, thank you uh, for the invitation from my own organisation. And from Aideen and, and uh, our minister, I think maybe still here, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, to move on, uh, we're talking about looking at monitoring, but how do we frame monitoring in the work that we're uh, doing within the centre, within the NDA, but also nationally and internationally? Uh, so, uh, why, why universal design? And, uh, Mainly, as I think Caroline uh, explained extremely well, uh, a lot has to do with poor design and with the lack of involvement of key personnel, such as persons with disabilities, older people, children, in the whole design process. So an example here is not in our own constituency or in Ireland, but uh, close by. And this is where you blindly follow compliance. So. This is a terraced house uh, where a teenager uh, with a significant impairment uh, needed a ramp. So the, the local council uh, followed the guidance, as in the, the local compliance, and this is what they actually put in place. Uh, no consultation with the family, uh, and the family have asked on several occasions for this to be removed. It's still there from what we can gather. There is a little notice at the very bottom uh, on the screen saying uh, teenagers desist from using this as a skating ramp. So, uh, so this is where, you, where uh, compliance uh, can be blind as far as that whole engagement with the, the end user, who's going to actually use this and, and they've been part of that. But also if you're following the basic uh, guidance that is out there. So what we're trying to do is move beyond that uh, this is a building actually in Dublin, uh, built quite recently, and again, we're seeing uh, people being excluded, people who, with mobility difficulties, uh, people using wheelchairs. Uh, so again, uh, and just on the corner of the screen, you can see a revolving door, and uh, you will see later this, this afternoon, our new e-learning module, which uh, does not favour revolving doors as the only means to get into a building. So universal design has been uh, mentioned several times already this morning. So key words in our legislation is, can you access, can you understand and can you use, be it a building, be it a product, be it a service or be it technology, which are core areas of the work of the centre. And very much at the core of the centre is diversity at the heart, uh, back to Caroline talking about the heart of our design process. And it is about looking at the needs of all users. Uh, so that's again defined not only in our national legislation, but also at UN level uh, under Article 4 and Article 9, which we're discussing here today. So what's, what's our basis? We're based on nine or seven principles uh, that are uh, universally recognised across the globe and uh, we were fortunate that we engaged with our central bank uh, and uh, an example just taking one of the principles perceptible information 
This is a picture from the central bank. Uh, you will see more this afternoon. Uh, but just looking at colour contrast and, and very clear lettering to signify one that you're on, on floor three in the picture, uh, but also then the lighting and the colour contrast uh, where the actual lift is and where the buttons are to actually operate the lift. So won't go through the, the seven, uh, that's for another day. Uh, the World Report on Aging and Health talked about three distinct elements, Ireland being included as, as one of the leaders in this, on having clear resources in place, building capacity uh, within organisations within the, the country you're in, uh, but also, uh, as we heard from the Minister, getting government support and backup. Uh, so we in the centre very much looked at building uh, resources that are readily and freely available on our website. Two of our most used uh, guidance documents are on the screen here. One is Building for Everyone, which is a series of 10 booklets talking about everything from the car park right through to the building, vertical, horizontal circulation. Uh, changing places is a new addition, which we will be adding to this collection uh, early in 2023. And also communication guidance that we've worked very closely with the Department of Public Expenditure. And uh, we're in revision three of same. So fundamentally, uh, key drivers for universal design, it, it's a human right. Uh, it's also built into our legislation. Uh, it is, if we get it right at the start, and as uh, Tony Cunningham said, uh, it's getting people with disabilities involved at the very start uh, of the process. And it makes good business sense, as Carolina clearly outlined in our presentation. So we look at it from a systems perspective. And in the middle of the screen, we're talking about monitoring, which is kind of the focus of this morning. But the other key elements, without them, you're not actually going to look at, uh, at systems changed and particularly long-term change. So policy, legislation, uh, standards uh, being core elements from a macro perspective. So that being at a national level or at a European level, we do significant work with European standards bodies, uh, including the European Commission. Uh, and then at an organization level, being able to monitor, certify codes of practice, which we have several I'll talk about briefly, uh, and then putting resources, toolkits in place, uh, the people, the how-to, how do you actually do this on a daily basis? And of course, training and support being vital elements uh, at, for people at the coalface to be able to uh, use uh, on a daily basis, which uh, we have several examples, uh, as was mentioned at the start, the walkability audit tool that we uh, developed with the National Transport Authority, Age Friendly Ireland and the Green School Initiative. Again, uh, the Minister mentioned this virtuous circle. Uh, OECD published a report in 2017 and talked about four key ingredients, talked about a strong regulation and enforcement, sufficient capital investment, Again, uh, Caroline mentioned about uh, the, the business sector, uh, significant funding required, research development, always very important because things constantly, particularly in the IT sector, is constantly improving and evolving on a daily basis. And of course, recognition of benefits for the wider, in the widest sense. Uh, so again, back to that, kind of where, where we're at and recognising the abilities of everybody, uh, including persons with disabilities, older people, etc. So uh, under our monitoring role, we have uh, three that we've been working on for a number of years, Code of Practice on Accessibility of Public Services and Information, uh, where it's a statutory obligation for public bodies uh, to have accessible services and information. Uh, we're in the process of finalising a revision of that code of practice, which will be going to the government uh, before Christmas and to be published in 2023. Uh, we have an existing uh, code of practice on heritage sites, which we're evaluating, uh, particularly as I, I'll mention in the next slide, and part five, which uh, we've been working since 2007 
on looking at the percentage of persons with disabilities employed in the public sector. New uh, additional um, requirements are areas that we've been asked by the government uh, to monitor and evaluate is the Web Accessibility Directive, which was signed into legislation in 2020. Uh, also uh, monitoring the implementation of the Irish Sign Language Act, which again we were asked to review in late 20 and we've uh, uh, submitted a report to the government, which again uh, we're hoping will be published this side of Christmas. And also a new development, uh, we, a request from the Minister to develop a new code of practice on accessibility of public buildings and that is going through consultation and further consultation on that uh, to be published probably second quarter 2023. So just to uh, give a summary of what is part five and, and the percentage of persons with disabilities. Uh, we have been doing this since 2007, as already mentioned. Uh, it's to promote and support employment of persons with disabilities and to achieve the current employment uh, target of minimum, again, minimum of 3%. Uh, within each government department, there is a monitoring committee in place, which is very uh, important uh, regarding the 3%. Uh, in that they're engaging with all their agencies under their remit on, I suppose, informing them about employment, but also on gathering that information on a yearly basis uh, that they then submit to ourselves. So they have to do that on an annual basis, and that has to be submitted to us by June of each year. And in turn, we have to submit our uh, report, which we will be completing in the next two weeks next week actually, uh, we'll be submitting to the Minister for 2021. Uh, so, uh, as already mentioned, uh, the, there is a change in uh, regulation that it will be moving up to 6% by 2025. And I suppose back to Caroline's comment at the start, how do we uh, energise the public sector uh, to employ more people with disabilities, but also a key point, how will people with disability feel more comfortable in an organisation uh, to disclose that they have uh, a disability? And that comes back to culture. Uh, part three, uh, we cover access to services, uh, ensuring goods and services public procured are accessible. And that's a significant one that we're uh, pursuing with the Office of Government Procurement. And moving on, uh, I'm just being told I need to move time-wise here. So we've looked at 292 public bodies and we've a report with government on looking specifically at the access officer uh, that we were able to do direct monitoring, looking at uh, websites of 292 public bodies have they got an accessibility officer uh, registered on their website, which is a requirement on the legislation. Uh, as mentioned, the Web Accessibility Directive, we have carried out a monitoring role in 2021 on that, and that was published on our website and submitted to the European Commission. And uh, the uh, sorry, it's we're not moving on here. Yes, so quickly, the uh, what we've looked at is the accessibility statement, how it complies with the web uh, guidance, the WACAG 2.1, but also the European standard 301549. Some of the uh, statistics on this. I suppose the largest number of sites apps ever reviewed, 400 sites evaluated in 2021, uh, 280,000 pages evaluated on a weekly basis and approximately 700 uh, per website. Uh, compliance is not great. So over two thirds of websites uh, are uh, not accessible. And key issues that came up as a snapshot, uh, colour, P 
PDFs not accessible and name role value, which is mainly forms, as in the bane of online forms being a significant issue, uh, not only for persons with disabilities, but I think for every one of us. Uh, again, part of the resources that we provide, we've done a, a series of webinars with the Irish Computer Society, and we're still running a number of webinars between now and the end of the year. Uh, we have significant guidance and advice on the website, universaldesign.ie, and we're working very closely with Salesforce, who will be presenting this afternoon on work that we have been doing on creating, I suppose, a more interactive uh, and simplified portal for uh, companies and agencies to submit their data and to evaluate their data on a weekly basis. So, uh, in conclusion, where we're at at the moment with codes, uh, we're managing accessibility, but moving on, uh, the next stage is on getting user feedback on how services are being operated and being delivered by public bodies, but also looking at the private sector, as already mentioned, the European Accessibility Act coming on stream uh, in the near future. So, in short, the only important thing about design is how it relates to people. Uh, Victor Papanek, uh, and I suppose a core element of what the centre's role is, is engaging with people. How do we design things better now and into the future? So thank you for your attention. And at uh, this moment, I'm calling on my colleagues, Donna Rice and Naomi Oldenburg uh, to the stage for some Q&A regarding our monitoring and evaluation uh, processes. And uh, we're open for questions. Over to the audience and over to Caroline for online. There. The work of CUD from that uh, presentation. So, just a couple of questions here. Um, so, the first one says how uh, many public sector bodies are working within set budgets, so money is very tight. How can organizations incorporate universal design into their projects, buildings? services, etc., in a cost-effective way. And just in case the mic doesn't come back, I'll throw in another one. Uh, what kind of enforcement mechanisms are in place for ensuring compliance with the Web Accessibility Directive, Part 3 and Part 5? Donald, you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> You're the closest. Uh, yes. I suppose the first part of the question, uh, thanks Caroline for that, is uh, in, in terms of efficiency, uh, do it from the very beginning. And I think Caroline Casey already mentioned about having people involved from the very beginning of the process. So in my area in web accessibility, if it's not in your procurement document and if it's not signed off and tested before you sign off with your digital agency, you will end up spending more money on it. Um, and, and that's just... Uh, uh, our, our, our long-held uh, experience. Um, in, in terms of compliance, um, and, and sorry, just one other part of that is, is, is wh while we are talking about compliance and, you know, essentially the directive is about minimal compliance with the standard, user testing is hugely important. It's a hugely efficient way to get to understand people's experiences of your website and the key areas to, to, to tackle. In, in terms of compliance, the enforcement mechanism for the Web Accessibility Directive is the enforcement mechanism that's already uh, available under the Disability Act 2005. It's a statutory complaints mechanism whereby a person may take a complaint and submit a complaint to a public body and that public body is required to provide a satisfactory answer, and if that satisfactory answer isn't forthcoming, or if the person is not satisfied with that answer, they may take that complaint further to the ombudsman. The directive bolsters that by also may, uh, requiring that that complaints and redress mechanism is 
very clearly outlined in an accessible way in the accessibility statement. So in terms of the Web Accessibility Directive, that's what the enforcement mechanism um, is there. So it is, to some degree, putting it, the onus back on the person using the website to complain, but who better to know what the accessibility issues are than the person who's using the website? Thanks, Donald. Sorry, uh, like Naomi, Sorry. and also um, to say that we have Nee Fall uh, online, uh, who's out with COVID at the moment. So coming in live uh, from uh, Kildare. Uh, Neve, you're about to... Oh, I just, sorry, and, and thanks. Um, and I really appreciate it, um, AFCON enabling me to join with you guys today. I think, Caroline, and I think we would all advocate for this, it's, it's a really important thing for people to remember is that nothing operates in isolation. So if you're talking about, you know, creating, you know, and, and it's beyond compliance, it's about work culture and it's about a culture of society as well. So it really is about looking at everything and making sure that everything is universally designed. So I think, if, and looking at having an, an equitable, diverse, and inclusive work environment. So I think if you look, if you look at the fact that if you want to employ and to increase employment opportunities for more people and create an environment where employees feel supported and comfortable in sharing their disability status, then it begins with not only just having an accessible built environment, but also having from the top down, having HR strategies that look at creating an EDI work culture, um, using universal design approach and focusing on increasing the recruitment and retention of persons with disabilities and supporting employees to feel comfortable sharing their disability status. But it's also then making sure that recruitment practices are inclusive, making sure that all communications, digital, written, spoken and signed, are universally designed and the key thing as well there are many many aspects of this but key things are um, you know consulting and involving persons with disabilities from the get-go and that's what i've said my spiel now i will now let naomi talk thanks dave naomi um i'm not sure if i can i can add anything that hasn't already been said i mean um in the code of practice on accessible information and services that does cover procurement of services and as, as Jeremy mentioned it's very very key it's the start kind of often the foundational pro part of the process which ensures that accessibility and or universal design um, or both are embedded in projects in changes um, and I think it's very important as well to make sure that kind of if you are you know it's, it's important to define accessibility and universal design and consultations with kind of persons with disabilities is very, very central to defining that. Um, you know, sometimes it can be a bit nebulous what's meant by accessibility, which means that when it comes into the procurement process, it's just a box ticking exercise and we want to get away from that. So, you know, consultation with persons with disabilities, standards, which Jared mentioned as well, can also provide technical specifications to use um, in terms of, of services being procured. Um, and yeah, I would just say, you know, in terms of enforcement, um, Reporting is often what we have to kind of make public bodies aware of where gaps in service are are and how they can address them. So, you know, we're not we're not there to kind of call people out or make them look bad. We're just trying to help public bodies serve the public better um, through monitoring. Very good. Thanks, Naomi. Um, any other questions there? See a hand up, uh, Tony Cunningham. And thanks, Joe. Um, I suppose just back on the part five, can you define what a public body is and who it doesn't include? That's a very, um, <laughs> there are many definitions of public bodies. <laughs> Um, and that's been something, I mean, there is legislation under part five that defines a public body. Um, but then when we have found, when we've looked at part three and looked at, for example, under the Web Accessibility Directive, you know, um, and then we look at, you know, there, so there, across the different monitoring aspects, there are not um, necessarily definition um, or, or the same definition, you know, um, but I'd be happy to only to email you and provide you with the definition of a public body that is under part five and, and under the legislation if that's helpful. I suppose my, my query around is to do with um, the monitoring side of it and there obviously 
are certain public bodies that have to employ a percentage of disabled people. Yeah. And I'm more curious as to those that don't, including maybe Section 38s, Section 39s, talking about in our own sector um, within that, because there, there's great variation. We're, we're not public bodies when it comes to payment, uh, alignment of, of payment with the public sector. Um, we are when it comes to climate action and having to meet the targets that are there. Um, we're not, presumably, when it comes to the employment of disabled people. So there's obviously a huge anomaly there. Um, so it'd be interesting learning more about that maybe and, and looking at that as a bigger yeah. issue. Very good. Uh, quickly respond to that, Tony. We, we did a review of part five, uh, which we'll be publishing either next week or the week after, and sections 38, 39 came up as part of that review, uh, should they be included. Uh, it would be, we would have to write to the minister to get approval for that, because it would be a change. Uh, as Neve said, there is gaps uh, across, and uh, I'll ask Donald just to talk about the, the WAD and the requirements under the WAD are very different to part five. But one of the things that came out of the review part five, back to Caroline's comment, was when we looked at both public and particularly some of the large uh, multinationals, disability was not on the agenda when they talked about equality, uh, diversity and inclusion. Talked about gender, talked about culture, uh, as in cultural difference, but disability wasn't on, on, on the agenda. So, But yeah, uh, it's... We can talk to you more on that, but they, they are different, which is a bit of a, a nightmare for us on, on our monitoring because the legislation is different. And Donald, do you want to just mention about the WAD? Just yeah, on Tony, that? you did ask about part five, but the, the Web Accessibility Directive, um, we're going to have to come up with a better name than WAD, but anyway, we're stuck with it now. Uh, the Web Accessibility Directive is... Um, it's got a broader definition and it includes organisations who for the most part are funded by government. So for example, in this year, we've monitored all the employability services around the country and their websites. Uh, but that's a def it's a different uh, definition, but it is broader than the one that's contained in the, in, in, in under part five. Thanks, Donald. Very good. Uh, one last question. I'm, I'm watching the timekeeper here, and, and I'm between you and coffee. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'll, uh, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, no, anyway, no uh, Martin Hoey, uh, Dublin City PPN, a uh, disability person. Uh, basically, what I'm looking at is access officers. As you said, they should be listed on the websites, but of those 292 bodies you're looking at, actually, how many have an access officer? And even where it is on the website, a lot of those access officers don't even exist. The name is there, but the person isn't there. And maybe it's one area we should also look at for employment, that the access officers should be a person with disability, because we're, we're the people who know what to do. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, very good point. Uh, as I said, we're uh, looking at a roundtable discussion on the... No, only, uh, 10th of November uh, with different government departments specifically on that issue uh, but uh, yeah take your point uh, why shouldn't they be a person with a disability being the access officer uh, but uh, yeah the statistics are not good is all I can say at this present moment in time what's on websites yeah. I, I just add there Jerry sorry that a question Sorry, Caroline. Caroline. Yeah. Sorry, Caroline. There was a yeah. comment. Just it was also about access officers that came in through Zoom, and uh, the point was made that it's very difficult for if an access officer is an add-on role to their work rather than their main role, yeah. uh, which would enable them to spend much needed time to support the the whole organisation. Uh, and is there any plans to to look at the, this? So it's just a related comment. Yeah. It, it definitely came up. Uh, it's a constant question and definitely talking to access officers where they're wearing multiple hats, not just two hats. Uh, Lee McMahon is in the audience here from uh, the Central Bank. Uh, he's wearing a number of hats, including being the access officer. Uh, so, yeah, it is an issue. There, there's definitely a, a problem there. Uh, and I think part of our monitoring as we publish 
uh, the, the latest figures on that, I think it will uh, probably be a wake-up call for a lot of government agencies to review uh, the role of the access officer uh, within their organisation. So. On that note, uh, I've been told time is up. Yeah, could I just uh, add one small little and, thing, Jer? And, and there's always someone who yeah, wants no, to. No, just yeah, if, if you want to learn more about the directive, the work we're doing, the monitoring we're doing, we have a stand here today. It's out behind the coffee dock. And uh, Ben Adamson, hand up, Ben. Make yourself recognisable there. He's our lead reviewer. He'll be available with myself and Denise at that stand. So come out to us during the breaks and we can talk to you all things Web Accessibility Directive. Thanks. Sorry, Ger. That's all right, Colonel. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ger, Donald, Naomi, and Neve. Uh, and I am um, making myself unpopular, as promised, if only with my own colleagues, um, because we uh, do need to break for coffee now, and we have a little bit. Uh, we've lost a little bit of time, so I am going to ask everybody to be as prompt as possible in coffee and come back uh, 15 minutes into this room. We'll start sharply. And just to say, we are aware from some comments that we've been receiving that there's a bit of an issue with the clarity of the ISL interpretation coming through at home. Um, so we are going to try and spend the break uh, looking at ways of fixing that. Some of it might be a lighting issue. Uh, some of it might be um, a, a Zoom bandwidth issue. We'll do our very best over the break and hope to get it resolved. So back in 15 minutes, Minutes sharp, which will be uh, five to twelve. Thank you very much, everyone.